All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for today's speaker series. My name is Stephanie. I will be monitoring things here in the back end. Um, if you have questions or comments, um, you are free to put them in the Q&A or the chat. Um, I will be sending out uh, later on an evaluation for this event. So please take the time to fill out the evaluation. We really value uh, your opinions to see what kind of topics you wanna hear um, in the future. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Florence Johnson. Dr. Johnson is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Michigan. Her research is fueled by a passion for reducing stress, anxiety, and depression among black caregivers and individuals living with dementia in community settings. And with that, I will turn things over to you, Dr. Johnson. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, happy to be here. Uh, just a little bit more about my background. I've been a nurse for about um, 30 years now and um, have worked in multiple uh, settings with my final position before coming to UMich um, was as a quality improvement consultant with our state uh, quality improvement organization, which really started me thinking about um, conducting more research to assist family caregivers in the community. So again, I thank you for coming to hear my presentation. Um, uh, I really, um, this was my first uh, analysis that I did as a doctoral student here at University of Michigan. So have mercy on me as I'm presenting it now. Um, this uh, care, uh, spousal caregiver research was fueled by um, watching my mother-in-law um, provide care. So um, again, personal reasons. I know I'm probably preaching to the choir, but every 65 seconds or so, a person in the U.S. develops um, dementia or Alzheimer's disease. And dementia is among the leading um, cause or most costly health conditions in older adults. Um, right now, there are more than 6 million older Americans living with um, Alzheimer's. And as you probably know, older Black Americans are twice as likely to have Alzheimer's or other um, dementias, more so than their white counterparts. Older Hispanics are one and a half times as likely to develop um, Alzheimer's. As the size of the United States population increases, um, those the baby boomers ages 65 and older continues to grow just as fast. Um, so will the need for um, more caregivers in the community as more people prefer to stay home as opposed to um, being institutionalized. The Alzheimer's Association is estimating that by 2050, the number of people 65 and older with Alzheimer's may grow to a projected 12.7 million unless a cure is found. Nearly all caregivers, about 48%, who provide help to an older adult do so for someone living with Alzheimer's or another type of dementia. Spousal caregivers often bear a significant burden of care alone, which can lead to feeling overwhelmed and isolated. Over 11 million Americans provide unpaid care for someone with Alzheimer's or other dementias. And in 2022, unpaid caregivers were, which included um, spouses, provided an estimated 18 billion hours of care that was valued at $339.5 billion. In addition to providing care, they mourned the loss of their life partner because the dynamics of their relationship shifts and changes. The stress can lead to increased depression, anxiety, and other health issues. So when I embarked on this um, research, my aims were to examine how spousal caregiving hours, so the amount of time they spent providing care, affected self-reported depressive symptoms. 
So it's their feeling of depression, not that they were actually diagnosed with um, the depression. I also wanted to examine the ethnic differences in caregiving hours and um, the, the depressive symptoms. So um, I did this research with, it, it was a secondary data analysis uh, of the HRS ninth wave data set. And as you know, um, the participants are Medicare beneficiaries 65 and over. Um, the data set was cleaned and our sample size was 10,120 caregivers of older adults living with dementia and their caregivers. Um, I decided to uh, use the negative binomial regression because it would have allowed for dispersion in the outcomes. And then a descriptive analysis was conducted on the sample to con um, consider such things as age, gender, education level, and um, health status of all participants. So um, after running the, the, char the characteristics um, analysis, found that the mean age for the caregivers were, was 71. They were predominantly women. 64% were white, 18% were black, 11% um, Latino and 7% other. As far as the depressive symptoms, we had a mean of 1.5 for people who had no caregiving hours. One point, um, I'm sorry, 1.6 for those who had no caregiving hours. And then those who had low caregiving hours, 1.8. And for high caregiving hours, it was 2.06. Each caregiving category showed that ADL needs were way higher than um, IADL needs. So these were the measures that um, I looked at. Again, self-reported depressive symptoms were the dependent variables. The independent variables were looking at caregiving hours. And this is how I um, chose to categorize them. So those who were not providing care versus those who provided one to 13 hours of care and then anything higher than 13 hours of care. And these were, care provided by the caregiver, not if there were supports in the home or paid caregivers that came to help. And that's why you would have the no caregiving category if the um, family actually had someone, say a live-in that did all the caregiving. So the covariance the variates that I looked at, again, age, race, gender, education. We actually looked at other um, chronic conditions IADLs and income, but for this talk, I'm not um, addressing those last three bullets. Um, so how did uh, HRS determine the care, the self-depressive symptoms? They used questions from the Center for Epidemiologic um, Studies Depression Scale, so the CSD, and they also had two questions that they um, used in their uh, own screening tool. And they started to, they did this because they wanted to understand the mental health of the participants as well as the caregivers a, a lot better. Um, again, I told you how I categorized and the different covariants that I used. So here's my initial result. This is based on a predictive margins and it's the difference between caregiving hours and um, race. So as you can see, the non-Hispanic white caregivers started with lower self-depressive um, symptoms reported, but as their caregiving hours went up, so did their um, self-reported symptoms. Here, the orange line is for black caregivers or African-Americans, they started, Sorry, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, the black caregivers actually started with a higher level of um, 
depressive symptoms and basically stayed unchanged as the caregiving hours went up. And the Hispanic caregivers also started higher, but they also had a slight increase in um, their depressive symptoms as their caregiving hours went up. And you see the same pattern with other. So of all the race categories, the African-American or Black caregivers actually maintained a steady um, level between caregiving hours and their depressive symptoms. So this predictive analysis um, looks at uh, education as it relates to depressive symptoms. So it showed that um, those with less than high school started higher, which is the green line, and their depressive symptoms stayed high as the um, caregiving hours went up. And then those were high school uh, diplomas, the orange, you can see that um, their, their depressive symptoms weren't as high, they didn't start as high. And as their caregiving hours went up, it just slightly um, had a, a slight increase. And then the blue line is some college, again, not as high as people with um, just the high school degree. And then college and above started lower and had a slight increase as the caregiving hours went up. So this was just a, a mixed effect um, multi-level modeling that I did uh, looking at um, the income and the education. This I actually added this uh, a few about six months after I did the initial analysis, and once again, it just shows that um, education and income does have um, an effect. So additional testing that I completed was that, um, again, I used a negative binomial regression to test whether the influence of the amount of caregiving um, actually, if there was an influence on self-reported depressive symptoms based on race, which it did, and uh, we saw that. I also used the test PARM command to test for the interactions of the significance of the interaction. It suggested that there wasn't um, a differing effect of caregiving hours on depression across the races. The margins plot was used to visualize estimated mean depressive symptoms for different combinations of caregiving and race and it showed no significant effect on Black caregivers compared to other races. So from the output, we see that African-Americans um, coefficient um, was 1.125, which suggests that there are 12.5% higher depressive symptoms compared to whites to the um, white counterparts. So modeling caregiving hours as a continuous measure did not increase a linear re, uh, re relationship. It, it just got a little, it just a little uh, complicated the interpretation a little bit for me. Um, an assumption, I made an assumption that the linear effect of hours on depressive symptoms would be made and um, so doing that, I used, I characterized the hours as low, non-low, medium, and high to account for potential nonlinear trends. So here's uh, um, the summary of my findings. Um, I think that it could be uh, an argument could be made that um, Black caregivers self-reported depressive symptoms were higher to begin with um, without even considering the amount of caregiving hours. 
So does this mean that they develop some kind of coping mechanisms that make it so that they don't feel any additional or feel that they should report any additional um, depressive symptoms? Um, and the other thing I considered was who was asking the question about depression? Uh, typically, African-Americans don't uh, admit to being depressed. So um, was there some type of bias when we're asking these questions? And what was the situation as the question was being asked? Among others, the other races, um, there was a much higher caregiving um, self-reported symptom versus um, hours of care, as we noted on the graph. There was no definition for other in the races. It wasn't specified. So um, not sure how this affects the, the rise in their symptoms. And the reasons behind this trend definitely warrants more investigation and consideration in healthcare policies and interventions. Um, it would have been better if we knew who, who was involved, what races were under um, the other category. And uh, these insights highlight the importance of considering both race and caregiving intensity when addressing mental health outcomes for caregivers. And what are the implications from this um, research for me? Uh, I think that we should establish and promote respite care programs that provide temporary, temporary temporary relief um, to caregivers. These programs allow the spousal caregiver to take breaks. They can recharge and attend to their own well-being because we know that um, family caregivers tend to ignore their own health because they're so um, entwined in uh, providing care. Um, and in thinking about this respite care program, in-home would be preferable to um, outside because we know that folks who have um, dementia try, tend to have um, um, adjustment um, issues with leaving their um, environment that they're used to. So if we could promote in-home respite care, that would be the preferred method. Um, the other implication is that high caregiving hours does appear, appear to significantly impact depressive symptoms, especially for people of other races. Organizations and policymakers should consider um, the strain that this intensive um, caregiving places on their mental health. Another implication is the financial assistance. We, the policymakers should consider creating a financial support mechanism specifically for spousal caregivers. This could include tax breaks that um, and subsidies that uh, Michigan just um, proposed this um, uh, about a month or so ago. Subsidies for home modifications, such as um, dementia-friendly environments within their home assistance with medical expenses that's related to the dementia care. We should also consider interventions that address the unique challenges faced by the different racial groups, providing mental health resources, respite, coping me mechanisms that can alleviate the burden on caregivers. This research also shows the significant implication for mental health interventions and support for individuals who are caregivers to their spouses. Minority caregivers, especially the under-researched population of Latino and older adults should be considered. Further research and targeted intervention is necessary to promote mental health well-being among caregivers of diverse backgrounds, not only racial, but um, financial and education.
So we need to have public awareness that um, because this study has the potential to really significantly raise public awareness about mental health um, challenges encountered by caregivers. By increasing an understanding and by increasing understanding and empathy, we can foster greater societal support and compassion for those who dedicate themselves to these caregiving roles. We should educate the public about the challenges faced by spousal caregivers and promote empathy and understanding. Educating the public means that um, we help to re this will help to reduce stigma and encourage help seeking by the caregivers. And also by educating um, the public, it highlights available um, resources and support networks and coping strategies that caregivers definitely need. We need advocates for equitable access to mental health resources and services. We should emphasize the importance of considering race, caregiving, mental health together as a package and encourage research and interventions that addresses the unique needs of um, these caregivers. But what type of healthcare policies do I see um, coming out of this uh, research? I think that we can establish comprehensive programs that provide information, resources, counseling specifically for caregivers. We should include guidance on managing mental health while caring for a loved one who also has a mental illness. Um, we could encourage employers to implement supportive policies for their for caregivers, such as paid sick days that allow caregivers to take time off when needed, flexible work hours that accommodate caregiving responsibilities, hybrid or work from home policies that enable a better work life balance, paid caregiver leave that provides dedicated time for caregiving needs and backup care assistance that um, offers support during emergencies. The policies could also advocate for equitable access to mental health services for all groups and address disparities in mental health outcomes among caregivers. The policies could also integrate mental health into an overall healthcare system, into our overall healthcare system and collaborate across sectors. So looking at healthcare, social services, and community organizations to provide a holistic um, approach. So when I talk about support services, I mean respite, therapy, support groups, adult day services. Training healthcare providers to recognize caregiver stress and depression is a must. They can offer guidance. They can refer caregivers to appropriate resources. They can collaborate with them to improve their mental health. And it's also important that we um, look at the, the caregiver and the person living with dementia as a dyadic team and um, care for them as one unit. My recommendations for future research um, definitely would, could use uh, more qualitative methods to dive into caregivers' experiences to understand their coping mechanisms and stressors, and also look at the cultural factors that affect um, their reporting or lack of reporting of um, mental health issues. We can investigate how other social determinants of health, such as economic st um, status, education, access to health care, intersect with race and caregiving. We can explore more how these factors 
collectively influence mental health outcomes. We can design and evaluate culturally tailored interventions for the caregivers. We can also test the effectiveness of support programs that address stre uh, race related stressors and caregiving challenges, applying the cultural lens to the work. So here are my final thoughts. Um, it's important that we note that while this study could provide um, valuable insights, the relationship between caregiving and depression is complex and influenced by many um, factor. And we definitely should take each um, situation as an individual situation. Thank you, and uh, I am open to questions. I wanted to finish with this quote from uh, Rosalind Carter, who says, there are four, only four kinds of people in the world, those that have been caregivers, those that are caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. And I see me in all of that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Um, I will open things up for questions. Uh, if anybody has any questions, you're welcome to put them either in the chat or the Q&A, and I'll keep an eye on those. Um, I was just, oh, here we go. Let's see. We have a uh, nice presentation. Can you explain why the divided spousal caregiver hours by 13? Uh, good question. It, and I will be honest. Like I said, this was my first um analysis that I did. It was a classroom project. So I will have to blame it on my professor. <laughs> we That's how we came. Um, he just thought that that was a good number where to um, place the cutoff. No magic to it. <laughs> Now, have you um, looked at or explored, um, you know, I noticed like on, on the the race line, you know, the African-Americans didn't accelerate as mm -hmm. much as, you know, the white caregivers or even the Hispanic caregivers. Um, and have you looked at any sort of relationships between like, um, like friendships, community support and things like that, things that would kind of you know, give people a little bit of stability um, that would help possibly with depressive symptoms? Um, that's another good question. And that's where the whole, um, I have not done any more research in that area. I actually have a, a couple coming up the pike. So, mm -hmm. um, yes. uh, but um, in all the, um, the journals that I read as I was doing this work, it's almost counterintuitive that Black caregivers' stress level or self-depressive symptoms would be even, considering that their care burden is so much higher if the person is being diagnosed later in their disease process. So it really blew my hypothesis out of the water because I think I thought that Black caregivers' stress level would uh, depressive symptoms would be much higher. Um, mm -hmm. So now I want to do more research to find out what helps them either cope with it or two, is it that we're not asking the right questions to actually draw the answers out? Um, yeah. And also the fact that as a culture, African-Americans don't want to talk about mental health, um, mm -hmm. depressive symptoms. And so I think sometimes it, it makes a difference who's asking the question and how that question is being stated. Or, um, so absolutely. all of that, yeah. Yeah, it's like, that, you know, this kind of ingrained resilience too, like, you know, just trying to push those symptoms back and yes. you know, yes. put to push forward. Right, right. right. Let's see, we got another question here in the chat. Um, would you say that professional caregivers, um, RNs and MDs that go home and have to be a caregiver 
have a higher chance of depression in general? Good question. Um, my research is also fueled by the fact that I have a really good friend who's been a nurse, worked at the hospital for 50 years, goes home to take care of her mom. She never even thought about the fact that her mother could have dementia. But with all the symptoms that she was saying to me, I could tell. I, I finally got her to go in and get her mom tested and she does have dementia. But here she is, a nurse, not noticing that her mother has these uh, symptoms. And just as I stated at the end, she neglects her own health because her mother has to come first. She works 40 hours and her, her mother refuses to have any of her siblings take care of her except for her nurse, her daughter, the nurse. So yes, I would think that um, professional caregivers, nurses, doctors, CNAs, will probably be on the higher end of that depressive symptom level. And there is a study coming up about um, um, CNAs and um, being caregivers. So they're called dub double duty caregivers. Mm -hmm. So we're working on that right now. Stay tuned. <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the um the topic of poten of you know potential future legislation on financial support for caregivers. I it's, I had the opportunity to talk with a couple state reps a few months ago, and it's just so important to you know to be able to, and I was able to talk with caregivers as well. Mm -hmm. You know things wow. that you don't think about. How yes. expensive is that walk-in shower that mm -hmm. you never thought you would have to buy? Like right. thousands of dollars. The ramps, right. the bars that people have to put in. Like you know that would be so helpful for you know there would be some tax right. credits, some subsidies for you know to help out caregivers. I, All right, we have exactly. another question. Uh, could it be that African American spousal caregivers consider it an expectation or normal to care for a spouse, so they don't want to report symptoms that would be would appear as they thought would be complaining? Absolutely, that goes for spouses. That goes for children. Um, when you, my friend, the nurse, she said to me, "I never even considered myself as a caregiver until I started hearing about your research." She was like, I was just taking care of my mother. Um, I take care of my aunt. I take care of my uncle. Uh, it, it is an expectation, especially for children, because your parents raised you. So you need to pay it forward or pay it back and take care of them without complaining, just like they took care of you. But uh, what we need to get caregivers to realize is that you're not complaining. It's all about self-care. You cannot pour out of an empty picture. So you have to rest, you have to take care of yourself so that the care that you do provide is of quality. And you're you're actually putting your person first by doing that, by taking care of yourself. I have to say one story. I always, when I flew, and they would say, put your mask on first before your children. I was like, who does that? I'm going to make sure my kids get taken care of first. But it makes sense. You can't take care of your person sitting next to you if you don't have your mask on and ready to be able to go. So it's the same thing as when you fly and they tell you to take care of yourself first. Mm -hmm. So we have to give families um, permission to take care of themselves first. All right, we have one more. Uh, can you Oops. go back to the statistics slide? I think I have another question. Okay, hold on. I stopped sharing. Hold on. <laughs> Can you see it? Uh, yep, just go ahead and flip the okay. settings. Flip it again. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I see your presenter view. Okay. Me and this silly thing. <laughs> okay. This one or this one? Mm. 
Uh, it says it was the slide about binomial regression. Uh, I think I only had three. Yeah, I think. Um, in the methods section. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, in the meantime, I have another question in the Q&A. This one says, uh, thank you for your presentation. Can you expand on your thoughts about the connection between research and advocacy for policy change? What do you see as the biggest barrier to policy change in regards to supporting caregivers? I think that the barrier is that one, we need more uh, federal level advocacy, like an office <laughs> that's just for caregivers who advocate for caregivers. Um, I don't, in the little time that I've been in this uh, world, I think caregivers just do it out of love that they don't even think about, like let's, let's unite and push for policy changes. Uh, they're so busy give, giving care, um, loving their their person that I and when you think about how much they save society billions of dollars in health care why don't we have an office that allows some of that money to go back into them uh so I think that the reason that we're not seeing a lot of it right now is that we don't have a strong advocacy office within the federal government to push for more All right, I have, uh, what is the difference between binomial regression and negative binomial regression? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, let's see. I think because um, negative binomial regression allows for um, the, the outcomes to be more dispersed versus the um, binomial regression, which is more concentrated. It's the way I understand it. All right, any other questions? We'll give it a minute or so. Well, that was a really great talk. Lots of nice information. It looks like there's a lot of different topics you can build off of that you're going to be working for a while. Yes. It's going to be great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm hoping to come back and present more on um, the work that I'm doing now as part of my dissertation and really diving into support services and how we can improve the mental health of all caregivers. That'll be great. We look forward to it. All right. Awesome. Have a great day, Bye. everyone. Yep. Have a great one, everyone. Thank you.